Good morning. Welcome back to Coffee with Vern. It's another beautiful day in the neighborhood. Did you know that? Oh man, I've had a busy morning already. Haven't had any coffee. The diesel though, I don't know if this is diesel. This may be just unleaded because it ain't as pungent as last week's. Last week, I, I thought I was drinking dirt. Um, there was soot in my cup after, if that says anything. And I left the cup for two days up here. I know that's gross. I know that's gross, but uh, I had to clean it and it didn't clean very well. So we got something a little lighter today. We're gonna talk about what's in that pot in just a minute. Um, but first we must get ready. How slippers oh man now these let me just talk about my slippers for a minute um, I love my slippers that's it's weird I know I'm 23 and I love my slippers I fell in love with slippers at the age of 19 oh, I remember it like it was yesterday shopping through Walmart and Traveler's Rest with my roommate Emilio I wish he'd watch these I miss him he's in the military uh, oh man, but we were shopping and we went down the, the sale aisle because we were in college. Y'all, I was broke. I mean, come on. Okay, didn't have a job. And uh, we see some slippers. He's like, dude, let's get slippers for the dorm because it was freezing. It was cold as, well, I don't know how cold it was, but it was pretty cold. Uh, let's just say certain things could cut diamonds, ice. I don't remember the phrase. You know what I'm saying. Some of you guys may know what I'm saying. But it was cold. It was cold as ice. Great song by Foreigner. Um, but man, we grabbed, we grabbed some slippers. They were $5. I wore those slippers all through college. They have holes in them now. So I finally replaced them. These are my after graduation slippers. But we have to put our slippers on if we're going to study the word today. And I'll tell you why I got my slippers here soon. But what a day. It's going to be a good day. I am excited about today. I've already been on a 10 and a half mile bike ride this morning. I'm feeling good. I'm feeling juiced. It was like 60 degrees out there. It was awesome. I got my old man meal replacement shake. I mean, this is good stuff. I got my old man slippers. So why am I talking like I'm about, I'm an old man? Well, I'm glad you asked. So let's get cooking. So today, um, we've got some really, really heavy stuff that we want to talk about. Um, I want to focus on one question. We're kind of getting close to the end of our questions. That's kind of cool. Uh, does that mean we're going to stop? Probably not. I mean, come on. This, this is a lot of fun. I hope you're growing from it, learning, and you get a good laugh, hopefully. Um, but we got good stuff, and we have really cool news to share with you before you leave. Something I may forget, so hopefully I won't. Jesse will try to remind me, but cool stuff to share before you go. Um, but we're going to talk about a very, very very heavy doctrine today. Uh, we're going to open the conversation really and truly. Um, but why the old man theme? So I, you know, I've been doing a theme each week. I, I had last week the office. Um, I've got my theologians today. Next week, got another theme. Next week, brother Malone joins us again. So we're going to have some fun. Um, but the old man theme today, this was like off the cuff, just thought about this. I was like, man, this is going to be good. So in college, I got called the old man all the time of the house. Why? I was the first one up. I was always up, and I was the last one to go to bed. Went to bed about 1 o'clock every night. Got up about 5.30, 6 o'clock. 6.30 most mornings was my routine, but to write a paper, I'd get up. I slept on the floor sometimes. That's a fun story. We'll talk about that another day. Um, but they called me the old man because guess who had the coffee on when he got up? I did. Had my slippers. Had my blanket wrapped around my legs while I was studying. Had my candle. I mean, I was, dude, it was, it was awesome. It was awesome. I didn't read the newspaper, so not quite that old. But um, I'm like, I'm an old man in a young man's body, I guess. Like, I, my routines are just, they're the same every morning. I eat the same thing for breakfast. I wrote a blog post about this. I think it's called Reflections. I can't remember the name of it. You should go check it out. But I talk about some of the same stuff. I eat the same thing for breakfast every morning unless I'm in a hurry like I was today because I went on a bike ride. Cinnamon Toast Waffles. They're phenomenal, and I love them. And if you don't like them, then you're a loser. Okay? That was a good comeback, right? I know. Um, but they're delicious, and I eat them every morning. And I drink uh, coffee every morning at the same time. I kind of make it two different ways. I used to make it the same way every morning. So uh, I used to do the K-Cup. That's boo-boo. That is just boo-boo, okay? And if you know what boo-boo is, it's not good. 
Okay. Boom, boom, boo, boo. They all the same. Um, but yeah, I kind of just have the same routines. I light my candle every morning when I start to read uh, the word. The word of God. Um, I just have the same routines. I'm reading out the same book. I've been reading out of it since December and it's taken me forever. See where the brown is? I read, I try to read a chapter a day, but this joker is swallowing me whole. Um, I'm just a routine kind of guy, you know? I just, I like routine. So quarantine has really just, there's no other way to say it, but it sucked. <laughs> I mean, it just has been bogus for me. But this morning, we're gonna have some fun. I'm gonna share a little bit about my own life and we're gonna dive into this heavy topic. And that's what we're gonna do. So you know what time it is. It's time to get the unleaded fuel into the, the cup. Today's cup is the best cup I ever bought. I don't, y'all should know my coffee collection cup. Like I really want to give y'all a picture of my like collection of cups. It's pretty magnificent. I already told Anna, like if she, you know, plans on sticking around with me, I'm going to need a room just for my coffee cups and my books and my candles. Like j don't put any, don't you dare put any clothes in that room. It's going to be for cups and coffee, books and candles. It's zen. I mean, why would you ruin my room? So, just so you know, I got a cool collection. But this one says Paul, P-A-W, Paul, and it says your coffee's ready. Not your, your, but your, Y-E-R, coffee's ready. And guess where Paul is? He's on the commode taking a dump. <laughs> and his wife's yelling out the window. It's great. I bought it at Goodwill in North Greenville. So if you think that's gross, come at me. I'm, I don't care. Um, so here we go. Are you ready? I'm ready. I set something on fire today. Oh, man. Oh. Now today's coffee, let's talk about today's coffee. Just bought it this week and I've never spent this much on coffee. Janice, I'm sorry if you're watching this. Never in my life have I spent this much on a 12 ounce bag of coffee, but I did. Um, this is methodical, like method, article, methodical coffee in Greenville. You can buy their stuff online. They are exceptional, okay? So Ubora is my favorite in Augusta, Georgia. Methodical is really starting to become one of my favorites in Greenville. No, they do not produce anything that's not good. But it's Costa Rican. It's a Costa Rican blend. It has cherry, elderflower, and something else in it. It's really good. I paid $22 for it, so it better be good. That's what I'm saying. But it's really, really good. So let's let's see. Let's see if I made it right this morning. Last week, if you watched last week, I could have thrown my cup off the side of the, the loft. I was so mad. Let's see what we got. Oh, I can taste the cherry. That is it. We need to just have a segment where I do coffee tasting and y'all just watch my reactions. That would be hilarious. Um, so this is going to be good. This, this, <laughs> this is some good stuff right here. Woo. Okay. All right. So Paul, so my grandfather, we called him Paul, 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 P-A-W. His name was not P-A-U-L, Paul. His name was Freddie. Vernon Coley. That's my middle name, James Vernon. That's where I get it from. I'm pretty much him. Like, I look like him. I act like him. I talk like him. My hands are really big like his. We have the same kind of big old nose. Um, like, we're very, very similar. Um, and I don't think, I, I think that's one of the coolest things that God has done for me is like just in my life, I've seen how I'm a reflection of one of the greatest spiritual men I knew in my life. That's just really cool. Um, I pray that you have that opportunity through somebody in your life. But my grandfather was my best friend growing up. I'm the only grandson. Um, I'm the youngest. So the red truck I drive, my Tacoma, that was his. He left for me when he passed away. He taught me how to drive pretty much. At, at 13 or 14, we started driving around his neighborhood in his 1500 Silverado. I mean, dude craziest most cool man i know a lot of people knew him here at the church um but by far my best friend um i may have shared on a other episode he passed away my freshman year of college of stage four lung cancer um and that was one of the darkest times of my life right i had to cling to the lord we talked about that a little bit and love to have that if you're going through a tough time i'd love to help you and kind of talk share a little bit about my own life to help you out maybe we can connect on that but um so I had a huge connection with him. Uh, he, we called him Paul. So when I saw this cup, I had to have it. Um, and we had a lot of poop jokes. If you like poop jokes, I have really good ones, just so you know. 
Um, and so that was why it was really funny it, he, sitting on the outhouse. And so that was our little thing. Um, but I found this freshman year. And so that was even cooler. Like he passed away my freshman year. I found this. So this has a lot of sentimental value. You know, I just, when I drink out of this cup, for some reason, I think of him. Um, he drank his coffee the same way every morning. Let me talk a little bit about his routine real quick. He had the same cereal. So I'm, like I said, same routine. He had a cup of water, a cup of milk, a cup of orange juice, and a cup of coffee. And they were all lined up. Craziest thing. Water was for taking his medicine. The milk, he had that milk. I don't, uh, I don't know what, I, that's maybe why I love milk. Orange juice, you gotta drink orange juice, James. It's good for your heart. So always have his orange juice and his coffee. Well, duh, we know why we drink coffee, right? Is it for the taste? That's for you to decide. I like it for the taste. That's all I'm saying. But um, so he was a routine kind of guy. I was, I'm very similar. I get that from him. Wore slippers everywhere. You know, he did the same thing. He also had the same routines in reading the scriptures. Um, his Bible is marked up with prayers and just underlines and notes from studying. And that's where I get a lot of my routine from. So if you've ever noticed, like in, uh, it's probably going to be in this book, um, the way I like underline stuff. Let's see if I have one right here I can show you. Um, yeah, here we go. So I underline stuff with a, a red under the word, right? I don't do like a highlight. That's He taught me that and it helps me read. So like, I'm very similar. He's, he, I'm, we're the same person. But I got some pictures for you. Um, so I'm going to tell you why I'm talking about him in just a minute. But this is my favorite. Um, I was happy. Uh, I had a big old head when I was a baby. I was a big baby, but I was happy. This is my grandfather and me hanging out, you know. This one stays in my truck. Good times. For all you that are like, James had a bowl cut. Here you go. Here's your moment for the make fun of me with my bowl cut. There's him on his birthday. I'm sitting in his lap. I look like I just pooped my pants. I don't think I did. I might have. I had jean shorts on. Not cool. Not. Why did you dress me like that, Janice? And a bowl cut. So there you go. But that's a little bit about my life. So why do I bring that? Because what we're talking about today is really, really heavy. Um, and in order for you to, as a diligent believer, and as one who wants to grow in their walk in faith, spiritually become very mature, to strive after sanctification in your life, it's going to require a daily routine and regiment of being in the Word of God in prayer. It's going to require that you are daily in community with the Lord. You can't just start studying these things and just get it. Like It doesn't happen. Ask any theologian. Ask any pastor. Ask Pastor Larry. Right? He's been here for over 30-something years. Do you think he got crafted at the things he does by just Oh, I, I do it when I want to. No, it, it's a daily striving after. Um, so his Bibles is one of my favorite to look at because it's so marked up. Uh, um, my Pastor Larry, uh, it's really cool. Uh, and you see the diligent work he's put into studying the scriptures. So for us to understand heavy doctrines, it requires daily striving after. So if you're like, man, James reads systematic theology and that's just weird and too much for me. Well, the reason I read it every day a little bit, like I'm working through this one, the reason why is because I want to be saturated in truth. It's a daily striving after. So I'm using the example of my grandfather and his daily striving after. We're talking about the old man syndrome and all that today because I want you students and elders who are watching, anyone who's watching, that when you look back on your life, you can look at the pattern that God has created in your life of studying and you can go, Thank you, Lord, for where you've brought me from where I was, right? You want to be able to look back. If you're looking back on your life at 90 or 80 or 70 and you're going, I know less than I did at 20 about the Lord, okay? You might have a bad memory, okay? That happens. That's called us dying. <laughs> but um, if you can't, rem like spiritually, you're not sharper than you were at 20 or when you first became a believer, um, there's something really wrong with that. Hello, did you do anything? Are you truly a believer? Those are questions we got to ask, right? And I think right now, in the time that we're in, with this quarantine kind of not over completely, but is kind of, you know, it's kind of hazy. It's a, it's a purple haze. Jimi Hendrix, it's a purple haze. Uh, I don't know what it is. You know, it's kind of, um, but uh, like, you know, in this, I told the students last night, we should have taken this opportunity for granted 
And we should be looking back to March when this started and going, God, I've grown through this because you've put me in your word. And if you didn't labor over these three months, shame on you. I'm just going to outright, I'm not going to sugarcoat anything. So if you're like, man, James is really cool. Okay, excuse me, James. I don't know who that guy Vern. Um, uh, if you're like, man, James is one of the cool pastors. He's nice. Or he's one of the cool ministers. He's a nice guy. I don't sugarcoat stuff, okay? Did Jesus sugarcoat it? No. I ain't sugarcoating it for you. If you want something sugarcoated, go get you a cookie from the Publix Bakery. You ain't getting it from me. So I'm going to take a sip to that. Woo. I'll drink to that. That's good. That's on fire. Wow. Lord, are you trying to tell me to slow down? Wow. Okay. Maybe he is. Conviction. So let's talk about the Trinity a little bit. How about we? Okay, so the question I got asked is how should we incorporate the Trinity into our lives and how should we go about them in prayer? Now, I want to take that question and kind of just like poof, like throw it up and like pull little points out. Does that sound good? This is what we're going to do. So the Trinity. First, what is the Trinity? How many of you can accurately define the Trinity? Because a lot of people can't do it. Now, and I mean accurately, so accurately equaling biblically and theologically, because we, I think if you're a churchgoer, you understand the concept of the Trinity, like the idea, but you don't understand it unless you've labored over it. It is one of the most difficult um, doctrines, one of the most difficult tiers under the doctrine of God to comprehend. Because guess what? We're finite. And we're trying to comprehend the infinite. <laughs> that's a fun time. Have you ever just sat and read something? And you're like, oh, oh. Yeah, that's me Like every time I study this. Oh, oh. Okay? So let's, let's have some fun with it. The Trinity. Definition-wise, I want to give you what John Frame says about it. So John Frame, in my opinion, has some of the best work on the Trinity. Wayne Grudem's got some really good stuff. That's Wayne Grudem right there. Erickson's got some good stuff too. And of course, Louis Burkhoff. I mean, he's a classic. But John Frame, as far as like a newer today theologian, got one of the best um, areas of talking about the Trinity. I love reading what he has to say about it. So the Presbyterians um, have a lot to say about the Trinity that is really good. So if you're like, man, I want to understand the Trinity a little bit deeper, Study some of the Presbyterians' work. The Westminster Shorter Catechism, Westminster Confession of Faith, has a lot of really good seasoned truth on the Trinity, as well as Baptists. I'm just saying the Presbyterian denomination has done a lot more in studying it than the Baptist faith has. That's not a bad thing. That's, we work together, right? We're, we're in this together. And so the Trinitarian basics, this is what John Frame says. I want to give you his quotes. He says this, So God is one, but somehow also three. This fact is difficult to understand, but it is quite unavoidable in Scripture and central to the biblical gospel. So what is he saying there if it's unavoidable? It means if you deny the Trinity, you are not truly a believer. In denying the Trinity, we are saying, God, you are not who you are. We're, we're not acknowledging his character and his being fully. So I always tell the students the best way to remember Trinity is this. It is three persons, one being. Three persons, one being. God is one being with three personages, meaning God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. So three persons to one being, God encompassing all of that. Very difficult to comprehend. You want some scriptural support? Go to John 17. You want to see one of the coolest passages of scripture kind of pointing to the truth of the Trinity? John 17, where Jesus is praying in the garden, the Spirit's interceding on his behalf to the Father. You see all three persons working together, but guess what? One being. Whoa. Now, I love the Trinity, like, and I love studying it because uh, what it does to my soul and for my life and, and my faith, right? So the Spirit dwells within us as believers. We know that. We know that from truth. If you understand salvation, you know the Spirit dwells within you, right? Your bodies become the temple housing of the Spirit. It's kind of symbolic and reflective of the Old Testament temple and the Ark of the Covenant and all of that. The housing of the Spirit today is our body. The Spirit dwells within me right now. How amazing is that? How amazing is we need to drink to that. Whew, man, that's good stuff. The Spirit is right here. The Spirit's in Jesse right now. Did you know that? Whoa, that's good stuff. Wow. I wish these guys were sitting right here with me so we could talk about it because they both did a lot of work on it. Wow. 
That's cool stuff. So the spirits dwell in between in us right now, Jesse. Wow, that got goosebumps. That's awesome. And Jesus, our living Savior, Jesus Christ is sitting at the right hand of the Father right now. And guess what? God the Father is on the throne, ruling actively and reigning actively in our midst right now. He is sovereign. Everything's in his hand. Right? He moves and it moves. He speaks, it moves. That, how amazing is that? So what does the Trinity do for us in teaching us a little bit about our faith? First of all, I think the Trinity acknowledges, uh, uh, acknowledges our littleness in compared to God's bigness, if I can use childlike terms for you. Right? So we are very, very small when we compare ourselves to the majesty of God. The Trinity portrays the majesty of God to me more than any other doctrine. Because how majestic is it to think that three persons within one being working together to glorify himself? I mean, do you, have you, do you understand and comprehend the majesty that is in that? I mean, no other God, right? Because all other gods are dead, first of all. But no other faith has something this powerful, this this majestic, this holy, right? Because I mean that I could just—I mean I could just hang out here all day. I, I really, I really could hang out here all day and just start blasting like different things. Like this, this is something worth chewing about. So we're gonna spend two weeks on the Trinity, if that's okay. We're just kind of open in the conversation today, and then we're gonna talk about the different parts and like functions and how they work and all of that good stuff. Sound good? Today we're just talking about it. So back to the Trinity definition because I took a rabbit trail over there and I got I had fun with it. The doctrine of the Trinity teaches both God's threeness and his oneness. The adjective triune refers to God as both three and one one, right? So that's where we get triune God. Um, so we begin our study of the Trinity by focusing on God's oneness. This is the order followed in Scripture itself. The Old Testament puts most emphasis on God's oneness. The New Testament focuses far, far more clearly on the personal distinctions with God's being. Right? So Trinity, um, best defined, is one being, God, three personages. Three persons to one being. Okay? Easiest definition. Um, and so we're going to talk a little bit about what he talks about how the Old Testament points to just God as, as oneness next week. And the New Testament focusing on the unity of the threeness next week. Um, because we see Jesus, well, uh, Sinclair Ferguson, another great Presbyterian theologian, talks about how uh, Jesus, before he goes to the cross, focuses on the Trinity far more than he does anywhere else. So chapters 13 through 17 of John. So some great textual evidence, if you need to go check that out. Um, is John 13 to 17. But what I want to kind of do to open the conversation of the Trinity to kind of close out this morning, and then I'm going to read something from my systematic for you, and then we'll kind of close the conversation. We're going to hit like certain tiers of it next week. But this week, I just want to open the conversation. Let's talk about the Trinity, right? I think the Trinity scares people um, because it is very difficult to comprehend, right? I'm not a a master at this. Let me... uh, I am, trust me, I, I ain't got all the information. <laughs> I don't know it all. Um, I'm out here trying to figure it out like you are. Um, the Lord has just called me to be a voice for his name, so I'm going to help the best I can. Um, but we're going we're gonna to study this together and dive deep. Um, R.C. Sproul, one who has great works on the Trinity, doesn't know it all. John MacArthur, all of them, of today's theologians. Go back to these boys, Luther, Spurgeon. Great works on the Trinity. They don't know it all. But can you think of, think about this as you're sitting here and listening? Think about one day when we get to see the Lord and all of that comes into reality for us right there. Now, it is reality now. That's not what I'm saying. I'm just saying like when it does, it kind of just, it fully makes sense, right? When the unknown becomes the known in our life fully, right? This is known truth. It's supported in Scripture. It's fully known according to Scripture. But what I'm referring to is the fact that Romans uh, 11, oh, the depths and the wisdom and the knowledge of the Lord, how unsearchable and unscrutable are his ways. Romans 11, 33 through 36, right? All the uncomprehensibleness, things that we don't understand because we're finite. When that becomes just boom in our face and we see it in its full glory one day, think about the labor that we put in here, how that's going to benefit us then. When it's just like, God, this makes sense now. 
I look forward to that day. So I want to kind of close out on this. This is The Valley of Vision, The Puritan Prayer. It's one of my favorite books. Uh, Miss Caps, Miss Anna bought this for me for Christmas. Uh, it's one of my favorite books. Cling to it in college. Highly recommend it for you guys. Three and one, one and three, God of my salvation. So the Trinity helps us understand salvation as well. And get that. That's what we're going to close on. Heavenly Father, blessed Son, eternal Spirit, I adore Thee as one being, one essence, one God, and three distinct persons. For bringing sinners to Thy knowledge and to Thy kingdom. This is good stuff. O Father, Thou hast loved me and sent Jesus to redeem me. O Jesus, Thou hast loved me and assumed my nature. Shed Thine own blood to wash away my sins. Wrought righteousness to cover my unworthiness. And then he recognizes the Holy Spirit. O Holy Spirit, Thou hast loved me and entered my heart, implanted their eternal life, revealed to me the glories of Jesus. So what is the Puritan doing when he's praying here? He's recognizing all three parts, all three, excuse me, wrong, all three persons of the one being, not parts, persons. Sorry, tongue tied. So he's recognizing all three persons of the one being in his prayer. We should strive after that, right? So in my prayers, I have strived after kind of doing that. I approach the Father, I write Heavenly Father, and then I, I recognize all three persons in my prayer. I close in Jesus' name of saying, I'm coming to you, Father God, in the authority of Jesus because of what he's accomplished. Because now when you look at me, you see your son. And the spirit is interceding in my weakness. We know that from Romans 11, I mean Romans 8, right? He's interceding on my behalf, helping me in those groanings of where I don't really understand what to pray. When I'm burdened with sin, convicting me and pouring out my life before the Lord. And Jesus is interceding on my behalf before the Father because the Father is holy, fully holy. I cannot be in the presence of a holy God, but Jesus goes on my behalf. And so we should pray in that way. Um, it is biblical. It is absolutely biblical. We see an example of it in John 17 with Jesus himself. And so we'll read more of that next week. I wanted to give you just a little glimpse of that. And then I want to leave you with this. Um, this is Joel Beakey. His systematic theology, one of my favorites. And he says this. This is going to open us into next week and what we're talking about. The good news of salvation is inseparably bound up with the doctrine of the Trinity. So why is the Trinity essential for us to talk about? Because it is bound up within salvation. They work together. You can't talk about salvation without talking about the Trinity. right? So if you're like, I deny the Trinity, guess what? You don't give a poop about salvation. You ain't a believer if you deny the Trinity. I fought this battle in college with people, people. See what I did there? I, I fought this battle. This is a hill I'm willing to die on, the Trinity. I think it's a hill that believers should be willing to fight on. Absolutely. I got beat up for it, but I don't care. If any of you are watching this from college, I hope you know what I'm referencing to, okay? I love y'all. Um, but every aspect, he says, of salvation involves the direct agency of God. Yet the three divine persons act in distinct ways. So what does Joel Beakey says? He just affirms what I just said. Every aspect of salvation involves the direct agency of God, the being, meaning the three persons, because they are one. One being, God, three persons. It's all together. It is hard to understand, but wow, when you start getting little tidbits of it, you start pulling off the little pieces of the steak and chewing on it and gnawing on it for a minute, you know what I'm talking about? You get a piece of fat and you're just there for like a hot five minutes. Yeah, starts making sense. So um, what I encourage you to do uh, to prep yourself for next week, because we're going to start going into different tiers of it. I kind of want to start taking a little bit of topics and just kind of like working on them, if that's okay. I, I think that'd be good for us to kind of hang out in certain areas when we need to. Help you grow spiritually, I pray, and, and me, because guess what? This is helping me. Um, what I need you to do is go read John 17. Kind of look at that prayer. Look at the prayer of your Savior in the garden, right? Study some passages of the Trinity. They're all throughout the scriptures. Go, I mean, the Trinity, the word itself is not acknowledged, right? But all three are seen. See, in Genesis, if you've been in my Genesis study, you know what I'm talking about. You know what I'm talking about. I went in on that. Remember, I had like an epiphany when I started studying that. I was like, whoa, whoa. Yeah, yeah, you know what I'm talking about. So until then, until next week, sip on a nice cup of coffee. Man, that's good. That's really good. Drink yourself an old man's shake. You might need it. It's got five grams of fiber. I'll see how that happens. Lord help me. And cut you off a nice piece of steak with some fat. Chew on it for a hot minute.
just like, you know, like a cow would with some cud. And come see me next week when we get back into the heaviness of the Trinity. Until then, stay happy. Blessings. Love y'all.